you're really stronger than you think you are. Like I laid in bed many, many nights at this place on these little thin jail mattresses in this metal bar and thought tonight's the last night that I'm going to try. Like I'm going to wake up tomorrow and just lay here. I don't care if I get in trouble. I don't care if they send me away somewhere else. I'm just going to give up because there's no point in continuing to try. But like, that's exactly what they're wanting. Don't give in to like what they're trying to groom you to do. Don't become what they say you will. Prove them wrong. Welcome to Stronger Than You Think, a podcast by Youth Villages. I'm your host, Alec Ogg. In each episode, you'll hear a story of resilience from a former foster youth. They've overcome unimaginably difficult circumstances and they'll share a mental health practice that helped them to persevere. You'll also be hearing from mental health professionals who work at Youth Villages. They'll add some clinical perspective on how you can incorporate these mental health tools into your own life so that you can be stronger than you think. Our guest today is Jake. My name is Jake, and originally I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I now live in Johnson City, Tennessee. We'll be discussing how Jake's mindset of not wanting to become another statistic helped him to persevere. The statistics we'll be talking about come from the approximately 20,000 young people who age out of child welfare systems every year when they turn 18. These stats show us that they face an array of negative outcomes. I want to introduce a few of those outcomes here so that you understand what Jake is referencing in the episode. 20% of foster youth who age out of foster care become instantly homeless. Half develop a substance abuse problem. Less than 3% earn a college degree at any point in their life and 25% of foster youth will be incarcerated within two years of aging out. Luckily, the Youth Villages program LifeSet is actively changing those outcomes by supporting young people through that transition. That brings me to the second person you'll be hearing from in this episode. I'd like to introduce John Milner. Yeah, so I am John Milner. I'm a licensed program expert for our Oregon programs. I work with a couple of different teams We've got our intercept program, which is like intensive in home three times a week, working with uh, kids and families that are on the verge of displacement, residential, things like that. And then also our life set program for transitional living age youth and our cats program, which is for like crisis response in the moments getting called to like the ER and trying to divert cases to keep them in the home and get them connected with resources. And so my job is to kind of oversee those programs with a clinical lens and review treatment plans, give trainings, and just basically help our team of specialists give the best care to these families that they possibly can. Um, And I've been with Youth Villages for over 10 years now, which is crazy to think about. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) We'll be hearing more from John later in the episode. But before we get into Jake's story, I want to give a quick content warning that this episode contains references that may be triggering and difficult to hear. This includes references to abuse, domestic violence, homophobia, and mental illness. This trigger warning is to empower you as the listener to make a healthy decision about if, when, and how you should consume this episode. If you need support, please look at the links for resources we've listed in the show notes. Now, here's Jake's story. Jake, thinking back on your story, what would be a good place to start? Really, the beginning of everything that has like happened to me was I was 14 and there were a lot of issues with my mom and my stepfather. There was a lot of domestic violence and abuse and neglect of a child, obviously. It was terrifying, first of all. It was just like, because it had been happening for such a long time and it started when I was really little. And a lot of those I still remember. It was just really hard to be like this kid and to see the smallest arguments turn into like fist fighting and choking and throwing things at each other. One time my stepdad stopped the car and made us get out and walk back to the house. And there were a lot of specific times where I felt like personally responsible because my mom was like telling me to call the police. And then on the other hand, my stepdad was like, if you call the police, I'm coming after you next what do I do? Like, am I, do I call the police and have to deal with my stepdad coming after me and whatever happens, happens by the time whoever gets here? Or do I just stop and go away? And a lot of times, like, I would just, like, learn to assess the triggers of things that were about to happen. And I would just leave and I would, like, leave the house and, like, walk away. 
I would just walk down the street and walk around our neighborhood until I could feel like things were going to be okay when I get back. And I would go home and like crack the door open to see if I could hear anything and to make sure there wasn't any screaming or I couldn't hear anybody yelling. And was your mom physically hurt? Yeah, a lot of times she ended up with like bruises on her wrists and her neck and she got a lot of black eyes. There was a lot of pressure from her friends to be like, you know, like, why didn't you step in and say anything? And I'm like, I'm for like at the time I was feeling bad and I felt like, I, yeah, wow, this is my fault. But now that I'm looking back at it, I'm like, I was a child. What do you expect me to do? And I was like, you know, if you would just leave, it wouldn't be this bad. Or if you would just not make him so mad or do what you do, it wouldn't be so bad. And a lot of blame went to my mom. And like, even for the longest time, I was blaming her because like, I wanted to be out of that environment so bad, but I would always like pick up the same ideals that my family would have and just like constantly shift the blame to her. And it'd just be like, well, you know, as long as I act normal when I'm not here, then I'll be fine. And if I just spend time away from here, then I'll be fine. School was, I mean, all the things that I've been going through had a really big detriment on me. So it was really hard for me to socialize with people, make friends and stuff. So I was the kid who had spent like my lunch period in the library with the librarian because I just didn't want to be around those kids without someone else there to mediate. And I was really self-conscious in that time. And I had a lot of anxiety and depression of my own to deal with, let alone with having to deal with the things that were going on at home. It made it really hard for me to connect with people. And I was like, just starting to come to terms with my sexuality and be comfortable with that. So it was really hard for me to be open about that when I knew that these kids were like saying these things about me and being hurtful. So it made it a really hard time for me. For a long time, the only things that I was used to was like hearing my family were just use not even like using the f word and just gay slurs but just like synonymous with things is like lesser and like not acceptable we were southern baptists of course like we live in tennessee what's new so like going to church every sunday and hearing people tell you that all these different groups of people aren't going to inherit the kingdom of heaven and all that i was coming to terms but not coming out that made it a lot harder to have to be able to like know that that's what was happening, but not be able to share it. I was trying really hard to be this perfect vision of what everyone was wanting me to be. So it made me hold a lot of myself back. Like I just had gotten to the point where I was like, this is just gonna be my life. Like it's gonna be a never ending cycle. There's gonna be like, this is always going to happen. I'm going to end up like this myself. There's no point in me putting in work to change what's happening now because it's just going to keep going. When you say I'm going to end up like this myself, end up like what? Like my mom and my stepdad and just have that abusive and domestic violence relationship and have to deal with these drug and alcohol problems. It, I just knew that it was going to be something that was going to come up in my life because it's just, I thought, something that you can't escape. It was July 1st, 2014, and it was at like seven o'clock at night. Some social workers showed up and were just like, you have to come with us. I'm not sure like what triggered them to actually come and take me away and like what those leading up events were and how they found this place. Cause like, you know, I was a kid, so I wasn't involved in that. They drove me three hours away from my home to like this place out in the middle of nowhere. And I was, terrified and didn't know what was happening and they took me to like this place where like you had to have a magnet to unlock the doors and like you had to have a key code to get in the front door and I was like is this like jail for kids like why am I going here like I didn't do anything to get here and it was just like terrifying The environment of the place itself was really, really toxic. Overall, the place itself, they really shine this light on themselves as being this super helping place and like this place that like loves and cherishes children and like want to help them and want them to overcome things and become better people and better members of society. And in reality, it wasn't like that at all. We had really like mentally and psychologically abusive staff who like were really covert with it. 
and really smooth with the way that they did things. And that's like why I say that it was like kids jail because it felt more like jail than it did like somewhere to help you. There were staff who would like walk up to kids and be like, you know, you're going to end up in jail one day. They would always tell us like, you're not going to amount to anything. These things are not helping you. And we can see that nothing that we're doing is helping you. Like as soon as you leave here, you're going to have nowhere to go. You know that you're not going to be getting anything good. You're just going to be street trash. And of course, like none of this would ever happen when there were like therapists around. They had like this big acreage of land and they were just all like next door to each other. Day in and day out, the same thing every single day. We leave the resident building, walk to school, leave the school building, walk to the administration building, leave that, go back to school, leave school, go back to the resident building. The therapist would come over and like pick us all up out of school or whatever. And they would be like, you know, the staff would just like praise us when the therapists were around and they would tell us how good we were doing. And they would tell us like, you know, hope your session goes well. If you need anything, when you get back, just let us know. And then we would get back from our session and they would be like, you didn't really process anything in that session, did you? And they would like almost gear us to become like the person who's like, yeah, I really didn't. Or like make it feel like it's okay for us to come to them and say, yeah, I really didn't. Like, you know, wanting us to give them that answer. These people weren't anybody with like a degree who was like treating us. These were just like our direct care staff, I think is what they were called, like their official title. They're the people who are in charge of keeping our routine and waking us up every morning and taking us to get food and taking us to appointments and stuff. I don't want to say there was a way to manipulate them, but there was. If you were quiet and you didn't ever do anything, you didn't ever speak or step out of line or say anything to them, then you became the person who they thought was the golden child. I learned that really quick. For a majority of the time that I was there, I just spent either all my time in my room, all my time at my desk at school, or like all my time on the couch in the common area because if you just sat there and didn't step in when they were saying these things to other kids or didn't say anything negative to any of the therapists or the people in charge and like tell them what was actually going on, then they would leave you alone. And sometimes like they would treat you better and reinforce you to do that. Some of the kids who had been there for a really long time and had like learned how to get on these people's good sides, they would like take them out and do extra stuff in the community with them and like reinforce this behavior of like, you know, make these people think that I'm doing my job right. And how many people basically were in your like your main group? It changed a lot. There were times when we had one person to all, I think it was like 21 rooms. And then there was a point when they were doubling people up. And I mean, like, these are not very big rooms. These were smaller than this little tiny bedroom in my 500 square foot apartment. And they would put two people in those rooms. So like sometimes it was doubled. And then there was a group home that wasn't on the campus. And that was for like the really good kids. They were being in a different classroom and they were like the ones who were put on a pedestal. And it was like, oh, you know, you all are the bad kids. Strive to be these people. I was like, you know, is this all there is? You know, because it ended up being that I was in that one place for that period of time. And then they had finally decided that I was good enough to go to the group home that they had created. And by that time, there were two group homes off campus. So like the good kids went to that one and the really good kids went to the other. So I had spent like three months at the first one. And then after that, I went into the one for like the really good kids. That was a thing for me. I was like, this is what it's always going to be like living with these people I don't know and being told like when to go where and what to do when. I was like, this is going to be a big cycle. I'm never going to actually be free. It feels like kind of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I just have like made that comparison myself. I love that movie. And I've thought about that so many times. Did you feel like the the therapists were actually helping you, like helping you actually process anything? I felt like a lot of them were trying really hard to help me. I felt like if anything, the program itself hindered our progress. After I had left the residential part of it and gotten into those group homes, things got a lot better. The staff were completely different. I was like, you know, like 
where have these people been all my life? Like, where have these employees been? Because they cared. And these were like people that I would talk to when I was in high school. Like, these are people I was like, you know, I have a crush on somebody. What the hell am I supposed to do? These are people that I would go to in the middle of the night and I was like, you know, I'm just freaked out. And I would tell them I'm anxious or tell them I need to talk to my therapist or talk about getting on meds. And so it was a complete turnaround. That definitely instilled a little bit of hope because like my 18th birthday was coming up. So things are getting different. It's like, I need to know what to do. And I wasn't included in a lot of those conversations. So it would just was like, I'm kind of helpless. I'm going to be really unprepared for when the time comes and it's three months away. So eventually I was just like, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. When you go into the group home setting, they transfer you into public school. And I had gotten really close with one of my teachers. She was like the first person I ever came out to because I graduated high school like four months early and we'd stayed in contact and we were still really close. And I ended up like actually asking her to be my foster parent. And she was like, you know, like it's a conversation I'm going to have to definitely mull over and talk with my partner about and stuff like that. And luckily for me, it ended up being like a really good situation. And they both said yes. Wow. What an amazing teacher. Yeah. (laughs) And what was it like asking her to be your foster parent? Because... That's such a brave thing to do. I imagine it could be really painful if they said no. So what was that like for you? It was really scary, honestly, because yeah, there's a lot that goes into being a foster parent. It's not like an easy trip to take. And who would take someone who's about to turn 18 and who is equipped to take someone who's about to turn 18 and dealing with specifically the issues of my background and where I'm from, like who is really ready for that. And so like on my part, it just came to the sort of thing where I was like, you know, if you are having trouble finding someone, I'm going to think of someone. And it wasn't even really me thinking like, she was the first person who popped into my head because we'd stayed so close. And it t- even after I decided that I wanted to ask, it took me a really long time to ask. There was like a three or four week period where I was just like, I had the text saved up and was ready to text it. And by the time I had texted it, she was talking to me and she was like, I knew something was coming because I haven't hadn't heard for you, from you in like three weeks. And I was like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> like the entire time they were both really, really great. And if, like, I still consider them both my parents and like, they live here in the same city so we go have dinner with them once a week and like i still like go on family trips together and we go camping together and we do everything together even though i met them late in life and i was already an adult by that time like i still consider them to be my parents they've had more of a positive effect on me than my real parents did because i used to be so uncomfortable asking for things because you know of the how I was groomed to not speak up and not ask for things that I wanted. But now that I have grown and like, I still struggle with it because like, I don't want to impose on people. And I have this thought that I'm always like causing problems, but I can always like in my head, no, it's like, you know, the worst they can do is say no. And what was it like coming out to her and basically for the first time telling anybody It was really just like this big weight relief because I was like, I'm not like, I mean, to some degree, I wasn't hiding it anymore because I was like starting to act more freely, not be as reserved, not hold my tongue as much. But like to just say it made a huge difference. And it was just like not holding your breath all the time because like coming out of these situations, like I was still asking them like in their house, like, you know, can I go to the bathroom or like, can I go take a shower now? Because that was like the thing that I had been used to for three years. And it was just like instilled to me that like they needed to know where I was at all times and never not be aware of what I was doing. Because like if at the place, if you didn't ask, it didn't happen. Wow. You would like come in from your evening activity or whatever. And you'd have to be like, you know, you'd have to say staff. And they would say, yes, what do you want? And you'd say, can I take my shower now? And if they said, no, we have other people in line and you had to wait. (laughs) And if you, they were like, yeah, you'd be like, okay. And you had to get your little shower box and a towel from them. And of course, like a lot of the staff who were working at the residential place when I was there are fired now or quit because people started figuring out what was going on. So like, from what I've heard, things are a lot better now. And like, there's the company even like switch CEOs and like clinical directors. And like, there's been a big turnaround as far as the residential side. 
We also want to make it clear that the facility Jake is discussing is not a youth village's operation or facility. It was it was really hard to adjust, first of all, because, like, again, that's such a big switch to go from, like, one polar opposite to the next. Like, when I moved, I was just starting college. And so, like, I was dealing with being in college early because I was 17 and I was in my first semester of college, moving into this new house and learning, like, these new people and learning their routine, what that's like for them. There were times when I was, like, wanting to go out and I would, like, go and ask for permission and they'd, like, you don't need permission, just tell us you're going. And, like, there are points in time where they're, like, don't even tell us, just text us when you get there and tell us you're already there. Because, like, they wanted to instill in me so badly that, like, this is my house, too. Like, I live here of my own free will. Nobody made me move here. Yeah. And it was really hard to let go of. And, like, now, of course, like, there are even sometimes when I will still be like, okay, I'm just going to run to the bathroom. Like, I'll just throw it in really quick because I don't want somebody to think that I'm like running off to go get into trouble because that's what everyone expected me to be doing when I was in this residential facility. They expect, like, if you're not going to tell us what you're doing, you're obviously going to do something you're not supposed to. Even though, like, that's just what they say, like, you know, you're here to live, not survive. Like, they really taught me how to do that. So it was very, I don't know, like it was hard to adjust to college, number one, because I was 17 and it was a little bit too early for me to be going to college. But also just because I was like, I always felt like I was being watched because that's like how I always felt regardless because these people were watching us. I mean, like we were in houses with cameras and in buildings with cameras all the time. What, are we, what did you end up studying? Um, I was a psychology major until April of this year and then I switched to social work. Okay, cool. And why did you choose to study those things? Because I want to work with people who are in my same situation and be able to provide better circumstances for them and make sure that no one goes through what I had to go through again. And even if they are going through this domestic violence at home, like be able to put them somewhere where it's out of a hellish situation and into a better one. What would you say got you through that very difficult time in your life? It was just me not wanting to be another statistic and like pushing myself to be the person who can be like, you know, just because someone is removed from a home or taken somewhere, that doesn't mean they're going to end up like on the streets or in jail or anything like that. Like there are things that we can do. We can be resilient and grow from our experiences. We're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And special offer to Stronger Than You Think listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash S-T-Y-T. The initials of this show. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash S-T-Y-T. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Before we return to Jake's story, I want to add John Milner to the conversation about not being another statistic. John, as we heard in the introduction, stats show us that 
former foster youth face an array of negative outcomes. In Jake's case, he was being verbally abused by residential staff, who we should note are in no way associated with youth villages. But they treated him like those negative outcomes were inevitable. So he was determined to... Prove them wrong, basically. Yeah. Sounds like, yeah. So how do you build a stronger identity when everyone in your environment is telling you you're not going to amount to anything? I think that's what made me kind of gravitate towards this story is that that connection, just what you're describing. Those were the the kids that I worked with in residential. Like they had been so stigmatized at that point. There's that, you know, that great saying that I use all the time that you call it, call a dog by a name enough times, eventually it'll answer to it. And it's the same way with these kids where, you know, obviously something happens to them. They have a lot of trauma in their history and then it leads to them having behave, acting out types of behaviors. But then those behaviors get mislabeled as, you know, just being a bad kid, having no future and just uh, being all around kind of a, a detriment to society. And, you know, especially as a kid and in adolescence in particular, you know, you think about what is your key role what is your key like stage of development? What's your, what are you doing at that time? You're trying to figure out who am I? Where do I fit into the world? And so if everyone around you is telling you that you're, you're street trash, you're garbage, then eventually you're gonna start believing that. And on some level, I start to see kids sort of just acting out that label at that point because they've internalized it. And so I think a lot of my work there, and then even with some of our, our kids in our programs that I'm working with now is kind of unraveling that, like helping them recognize that 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 maybe that's not the case and that actually it's the people around them that just don't understand like they're just ignorant of what's actually going on and that's the other piece of it too from a kind of systemic standpoint is how do we approach the the people in their schools their teachers their family foster parents what have you to help educate them to help better understand what it is that they're looking at instead of immediately making assumptions about these behaviors just being some sort of like defiant conduct disorder kind of thing. You mentioned starting to unravel those previous stigmas that might be ingrained in their mind. What kind of tactics or techniques do you use in therapy to start to unravel that? Well, one of our like our big models that we utilize and that I utilized quite a bit in these types of situations was cognitive behavioral therapy. And so we spend a lot of time doing the, the, the typical type skill building stuff you'll see in most therapies, but then it culminates in doing what's called a trauma narrative where you utilize all those skills and strategies to then kind of revisit this trauma that they've endured and not only reintegrate and desensitize to talking about it and experiencing it, but also sort of restoring it and processing the thoughts around it. You know, like, for instance, you have a lot of kids who have been through these situations and then through repeated messaging from people around them, they start to feel like I'm a terrible person or the world is, you know, just an unsafe place. This group of people is out to get me, what have you. They start to internalize these like big, broad kind of what we call cognitive distortions or unhelpful thoughts. And so we then explore those thoughts with them and kind of challenge them on some level and see if we can identify like maybe there's another way of them thinking about it too so that they can then start moving forward with just a different perspective that's going to allow them to be a lot more successful instead of just having this very universal negative look about the way things are going and sometimes you run into situations also like with Jake where you know he's kind of harnessing all of these messages into his own empowerment of like I'm not going to let them be right. Like I'm, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to, to prove that I am worth something because I know deep down that I am like, that's, that's a pretty powerful message in and of itself. Sorry to put you on the spot here, but w would you mind giving me an example of, of a cognitive distortion you witness in your experience and maybe a specific exercise you use to work through it? I mean, I, I do think that one of the biggest ones is this is my fault, right? Like that, that's a big one that, that has come up frequently where, you know, the, the youth is, has been through these terrible things and like sometimes sexual abuse too. And on some level, they feel like it was their fault. And so we have to do a lot of kind of like what's called Socratic questioning and stuff to sort of like pick through that 
and help them. And, and the key too is like, you don't tell them what they should think because that doesn't really work, right? I always joke, it's kind of like the movie Inception where like it's, it's more powerful for it to be their idea. So you have to like figure out how do you make it their idea? that this thing is going on? How do I like plant a seed that that can then grow? So uh, one of my favorite strategies sometimes, especially in the cases of like a youth who was sexually abused when they were much younger and they would say like, oh, it was my fault. And I'd say something along the lines of like, okay, so you, how old were you when this happened? They'd be like, oh, I was like six years old. I'm like, okay, so you were six years old. How much do you think you weighed when you were six years old? And they'd tell me, you know, some rough estimate. And I'd be like, okay, Hannah, how old do you, the, the person who did this to you, how much do you think they they weigh? And they'd give me a rough estimate of that. I'm like, okay, so you're telling me that your six-year-old tiny little self should have fought off this full-grown man who, you know, weighed four times as much as you, five, ten times as much as you, depending on the situation. And, uh, you know, that, that was going to work out really well. So again, I'm not like telling them that, hey, it's not your fault. I'm just like planting factual stuff and just ideas that they can then take and run with and think about and chew on and say, oh yeah, that doesn't really make sense, does it? I'm like, no, that, that doesn't make sense, does it? And, and then we'll use things like a responsibility pie where, you know, it's just basically a pie chart of who's at fault here. And we list off like, okay, who are all the people involved in this situation? And part of the goal with that is for them to slowly and, and you know, not always perfectly, but try to portion out the responsibility a little bit more appropriately. Because in the situation I'm talking about, they'll give themselves like the entire pie or most of it. And so we'll go through that questioning process and then help them hopefully shrink down at least their part of the pie chart and attribute more of it to the people who actually were more responsible for the situation. Last question. Jake was part of the LifeSet program at Youth Villages. Can you tell us a little more about LifeSet? It's mostly designed for kids that are sort of aging out of foster care and DHS custody and things like that. And we'll usually have them also, you know, learning how to manage their money and how to get a job, even how to just write a resume and do job applications, um, get their driver's permit figure out next stages in school. Maybe they're still working on getting a GED or graduating from high school or they're planning for college and we're helping them find scholarships and things like that. Now back to Jake. Jake, how did you get involved with the LifeSet program? So just because I was within the state program, I was referred. um, Actually, I was referred by another teacher at the public school that we were going to at the time. And so did that help with your transition from a life in foster care into the adult world? Yeah, it's given me kind of a bridge between those two. They can kind of be like the voice of a caring parent or friend and the voice of a therapist at the same time, even if they're not like a therapist. And they can sometimes bridge those gaps for you. What does not being another statistic mean to you? In my head, it just has to do with like the amount of youth who age out and have no resources and become homeless and the amount of youth who turn to substance abuse and deal with those types of issues out their life and can't get help for it. Or the type who end up back in either a residential treatment facility or prison because you leave those places and you're so used to like being institutionalized that you can't survive without it. So that was a really important thing, especially just to make sure that I was not ending up back in these places so that I could change these places. So your kind of primary motivation was just, I want to prove these people wrong. Really, it was, I don't want to say it was completely driven by a need to prove these people who I didn't even know wrong, but it really was. Like I wanted to be the person who leaves this place and then comes back like 10 years later. And I'm like, yeah, I just bought this place. So you're fired. (laughs) Like, I wanted to be the person who is making news and making headlines 10 years down the road. And these people see me and they're like, wow, like, I really thought this kid was going to be in jail or homeless. And like me, here I am talking to governors and legislators and telling them why these things need to change and holding people accountable. Because like, I wanted somebody like me who's been through it and cared about it that much to actually do something. And I want to be able to be that person. Like a lot of people, I think, 
when they hear the things that I say are just so shocked because they're like, you know, I've been to these places and they've never seen that. And I'm like, well, we know when you're coming and the people who work there are preparing us for you to come. So that's why you've never seen that. I feel like there's not enough accountability. Like there's not enough supervision of these places and these people, because I mean, they're all mostly monitored by the state, but I feel like the state's really not taking the time necessary to like really scope out if these places are good for these kids actually, or if that's just somewhere to stick a kid because you don't have anywhere else to stick them. If you could give advice to someone who is where you were, what would you tell them? Really, it's so wild that it's just like the name of the podcast and exactly what I say, but like, you're really stronger than you think you are. Even though like, I know this feels like the last night you're going to be able to deal with all this. Like I laid in bed many, many nights at this place on these little thin jail mattresses and this metal bar and thought tonight's the last night that I'm going to try. Like I'm going to wake up tomorrow and just lay here. I don't care if I get in trouble. I don't care if they send me away somewhere else. Like I'm just going to give up because there's no point in continuing to try. But like, that's exactly what they're wanting. Like, don't give in to like what they're trying to groom you to do. Don't become what they say you will. Like, fight for what you deserve and stand up for yourself. Stand up for what you deserve and what these other kids deserve. Make your voice heard. These people are hired to take care of you, not to belittle you and tell you all these things that you're never gonna be. So like, prove them wrong. I just, will never stop talking about holding these people accountable. When they tell me the opportunity to speak about something, I'm like, yeah, set me up with it. I'm going to do it. If somebody was like, we're going to gathering people together from the Youth Villages program to go speak to the president, I'd be like, I've got a plane ticket. Let's go. I want to be getting in people's faces and be like, not everybody's getting treated the way you think they are. And you need to be looking at that more deeply than you are. I'm very proud of myself. Because I used to be really so nonchalant about it. Like, you know, I just did what I was supposed to do. It's not anything special. But like, especially when I compare myself to like the other kids who've gotten out and like are in jail or prison or are dealing with all those statistics that I talked about and think, you know, like I overcame that. Like I am the reason that didn't happen to me, not anybody else. From Youth Villages, I'd like to say thank you for listening to this episode of Stronger Than You Think. And thank you to Jake for sharing your story with us. If you'd like to get involved with Youth Villages, go to youthvillages.org, where you can find out more information about our programs and how you can help. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, the best thing you can do is recommend it to a friend. Maybe share it with someone you think might need it right now. We'd also love to hear what you thought about today's episode, so leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on whatever listening platform you use. Production support was provided by Parasar Studios in Memphis, Tennessee. On behalf of Youth Villages, this is Alec Ogg reminding you that you're stronger than you think.